please put your hands together and help me give a warm welcome for our host, Dr. Lee Whitmore. Thank you, thank you, thank you, everybody. It is so cool to be here today. We are live at Full Sail Hall of Fame. I'm Dr. Lee Whitmore. I'm the Vice President for Education for Focus Right Group. Focus Right Group is Focus Right, Focus Right Pro, Novation, Amplify Music, Adam Audio, Martin Audio, and Optimal Audio. And this today, live, is the third episode, and thanks to Full Sail, the first time live because of the pandemic, of Focus Right in Education's Pro Audio in Education series. And we have an amazing panel today. I can't wait to get started, and you all are going to have a blast. We have three amazing professionals with me. The focus in the series is all about careers. It's about working in music, in audio, in sound, in production, mix, engineering, music creation. And we're gonna talk about some amazing careers, the folks that we have on stage, I'll introduce in just a moment. And we'll also have time for questions from you later in the session, here in the room and live. So with no further ado, I'm gonna make some introductions. We're gonna start uh, first with the gentleman directly to my right, Dr. Henry Panyon. Henry and I have been dear friends for many years. Um, he is a professor at the University of Alabama at Birmingham Music Department and is the director of music technology there. He's also been Stevie Wonder's conducting arranger for decades, and he's currently the artistic director for the World Games. I'm gonna turn to Henry for a moment. I'll introduce each of our panelists, but Henry, tell us a little bit about yourself, what you've been doing. What else does everybody in the room need to know about you? Well, I think we're a geek at heart, we, we all that. Um, I'm happy to be here, first of all. I think that uh, my whole career as a musician, I'm an orchestral conductor, an arranger, came to technology through music, and I still consider it my first love, but I know that technology has enhanced my career. So I'm anxious to talk about that. I do a lot of different things. I wear a lot of different hats, as most of our panelists will say, uh, but it all has led to everything I am today. Uh, looking forward to kind of sharing more and I'll let you introduce all the panelists. Fantastic, Henry. Next, so exciting, back on campus for the first time in many, many years, we've got a Full Sail alum who happens to be an eight-time Grammy and Latin Grammy winner. He's also coming off an 11-year term as a governor for the Recording Academy, and he's also a trustee for the Latin Recording Academy. Please join me in welcome Rafa Sardina. Rafa, tell us a little bit more about yourself and, and uh, how you got here today. Well, thank you so much for having me here. It has been 30 years, exactly, <laughs> to the point. You, I, I'm a graduate of 1992. Um, I'm my first, time, my first time back in campus, so this is super, super exciting. Yeah, I, the same as, I guess, most people in this industry, I, I started uh, being a musician, being a musician and having this love for music and trying to make it as an artist. And that got me in touch with technology. Same way, got me in touch with technology. I, got, I fell in love with technology too, and that's how I became an engineer, a mixer. And above all, I will say that a good psychologist, <laughs> because that's one of the, the main things you need to to be if you want to make it in this in this business. So um, I think that uh, part of my conversation will be focused more on that topic, on how to uh, fit in every room you walk into. And that's, that's very, very, very important. Fantastic. Thank you, Rafa. And last but not least, a colleague of mine from Focusrite, who's a mix engineer, a musician. He's worked with Kelly Clarkson, uh, with um, Skillet, with Straight No Chaser. I'd like to introduce Dave Riley. Dave, tell us a little bit about you. Hi. Uh, similar. I mean, we all start off pretty much as musicians or wanting to be musicians. Some of us make it, some of us don't. Um, and that led me to, I didn't want to stop, and I still wanted to create and have a passion so I went into the studio and just learned and kept doing that, but as sometimes paths stray. So I ended up going, maybe I shouldn't keep doing this for me. Uh, and because I already have so much experience with all the gear and with the personalities and, and all of that, 
it was such an easy slot to still be able to talk about gear, still be able to help move gear forward and create new technologies. So yeah, it's a fun path. It's a long path, but it's fun. Awesome. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Rafa. Thank you, Henry. So to jump right in, here's what we're going to cover today during the conversation. First, I'm going to ask our panelists uh, about an inspirational moment for them, because we actually got together and got, uh, talked a little bit last night over dinner, and part of that conversation was about career paths and how sometimes the path that you think you're going to enter into may stray, may go here, may go there, but it's an amazing journey. So I'm going to ask each of our panelists first, what, what's the, an early moment of inspiration that put them on the path that brought them here today and the amazing and cool things that they're doing? We're also going to, because we've got a room full of, and a, a, a web audience full of students, uh, alums, and aspirational career opportunity for all of you, um, I'm going to ask our panelists about what you all need to know. What are the things that are important in the industry, networking, technology, things like that? and then um, a little bit more fun towards the end of the panel. So to get started, I think, Rafa, I'm going to come to you first. It would be really wonderful if you could take a moment and share for everybody in our audience an early moment of inspiration. How would you get started on this path? I think that my first moment of inspiration was when I was only seven years old, and I thought I was a great, great guitar player. <laughs> I was the only one thinking that, but I swear to you, I told everybody, I told my family, this, this is what I'm going to be. I'm going to be an artist. I'm going to be... And I used to play uh, all kinds of pieces, even classical pieces. I love rock music. I was very much into rock early on. But I started playing classical pieces like the Aranjuez concert. I mean, just crazy. But my, my next touch point, you know, when I realized I could be doing this, happened when I recorded an, an album when I was only 15 years old. I got exposed to that experience in a real recording studio. Actually, it was a very, very cool recording studio. And we just show up and didn't know what the hell it was all about. We didn't know about the technology. We thought it was just going to be like us rehearsing, like in the rehearsal room, and just play the songs, and we'll be done maybe in, in three hours <laughs> or something like that. That was so enlightening. and. And that moment, I remember for the rest of the fo following years. During this whole path, um, my family moved. Actually, they moved to the, U to the United States. Uh, they moved to San Diego. I didn't stay with them, but, and I went solo. But it was in the back of my mind all the time, and I was doing shows constantly touring, I tour, I, I became everything you can imagine, a stage manager, a, a tour manager, a production manager, a front house engineer, monitor engineer, so I learned about all of, all of it, even, you know, I even did lights for boxing matches, <laughs> you know, I did, I did <laughs> anything that would keep me staying in touch with, with music in general and with the industry. And later on, I went to medical school. I actually did I almost finished four years of medical school while I was doing all of this that I'm talking about. So I will barely, barely get any sleep. But that was the kind of commitment I had towards staying in touch with my passion. I already knew that my passion was music and technology, both of them. Do you know? At that point, I realized I loved the technolo technological side of things. I, and I started learning about production. So that was pretty much my path. And should I keep going on or just, maybe we can touch some other points, but that passion led me to end up being here in Full Sail and ultimately making it to LA. Thank you, Rafa, that's fantastic. And yeah, I, Rafa just t uh, touched on a couple of things. We'll definitely geek out. We've got a bunch of technologists here on stage and here we are at Full Sail, so we will for sure talk about that some. Dave, let's go to you next. Give us a moment of inspiration early on. Your path's different than Henry's, is different than Rafa's, is mine. I'm sure a little bit of that. You know, it's actually quite similar. The first time I ever was in a studio was not a quite nice studio, uh, but it was big tape machine, board, all of it. And I remember going in being told, that sucked. And I went, oh, oh God, we, we suck. 
Okay, and that was the first moment of putting it all together and realizing, oh, this is not just we're going to have fun. This is going to be work. Um, but I thought it was so interesting to watch the tape machine move and see what they were doing, and that just kind of stuck with me. So after years of touring and playing and finally getting better, um, I felt like I wanted to be in the studio more than that. I thought being in a van is fantastic, but not as fantastic as having an apartment and you know, all the normal things in life. So that, that moment kind of came back, so that's when I went to go work in studios. But it was that thing of feeling like it was magic, feeling like when it was all done, and we actually did moderately decent tates, uh, it was great. And why wouldn't you want to do that forever? Thanks, Dave. Awesome. Henry, how about you? You know, I've been thinking about this question and, and thinking about you. And, you know, there are key moments throughout your life that you'll always be inspired, hopefully. So there were initial moments. I've been in music uh, since I was in kindergarten, literally. So that's when I started. So music was always going to be there. Um, but when I got into college and I had a chance to do an arrangement and hear this marching band perform in my music. And I thought I wanted to be an educator or a band director. I love that. I said, wow, man, I want to be a writer and composer. And then the next, I think, critical moment was when the Macintosh <laughs> came on the scene and I recognized, wait a minute, I'm doing my orchestral arrangements and I don't have to wait to go before an orchestra to hear them. And I can sit there with an A-track tape, because all the tape I had, but I could use a sync box and have all of my MIDI gear running at the same time. It was like, that's the world. And so the moment where I recognized that I couldn't in, uh, incorporate technology into what I do as a composer and arranger, it kind of changed, changed the world for me. And, uh, and I've been doing that now for a long time. <laughs> Fantastic. Henry, I'm going to stick with you for a moment. Here's what's coming next for the panel. Um, everyone at the, on the panel is working on some amazing projects right now. We're here to talk about careers. We've got a room full of and a web audience full of students, um, some just getting started, some on their path already. What I'd like to hear from each of you is explain a little bit about a project that you're working on right now. And for the students here, if they were gonna knock on your door because you needed some help with a current project or something that's coming up, what do, what do they need to know? What do you wanna hear from them? What skills should they have if they're gonna get your attention? Because some of them may be knocking on your door pretty soon. <laughs> Let's start with Henry. Well, the latest project I'm working on is a really large one. It is uh, artistic director of the World Games. The World Games are like the Olympics, and uh, it will take place uh, this summer. So as artistic director, that involves everything you see with the 700-member cast that we'll have from a 75-piece orchestra to dancers and a myriad of stars that will be there, even if you've seen the new the Spider-Man movie, Hunter Kowal, who's flying the drone as the goblin, he will be in our, pr our production. But when I think about students um, and some of the skill set, for intelligent students, we don't have to necessarily teach you. We're in a world where you learn a lot about all the technology. But one of the things that I love doing with students is teaching you how to learn. And some of the initiatives that I find with our students, uh, particularly the ones who want to hang out at the World Games, uh, have been brought from those who are doing sound design, uh, for those who are doing copying, some of the simple things as wiring. And so there are a myriad of skill sets, but one of the most important traits that I think you can have is recognizing that you've got to be, and I've heard this, I can't take credit for it, you've got to be a great hang. People have gotten to want to be around you. And they've got to, because you can learn a lot. We, in usually first day of class, I will know those students. Uh, who will end up being a great hang. Yes, your skill set has to be there, uh, your, your willingness to be uh, a partner and work, and your, and your work ethic. There's nothing to take place for having great work ethic. And I can tell you, very few people will outwork me. Uh, some who are much more talented than I am, but I think that a lot of the opportunities that I've had, thinking about myself and thinking about where you are, it's because I've been willing to just work at it. So I think those traits will 
will be reveal themselves right away. So those are the things I look for. Henry, I'm gonna add one little piece to that and then I'll, I'll move to Dave next. So you're artistic director for the World Games. H yes. how, how many people are involved in that production? Uh, thank you, and I'm gonna have to Im 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 really Im apologize because my phone is going off and I thought I flipped it the wrong way. <laughs> A great technologist I am. <laughs> so I'll give it to Rafa to put it on solid for me. <laughs> I'm guessing it's the president of the, is it the president of the World Games? It may very well be, he called me earlier. Um, so this production is huge. We will have, just on the creative staff, uh, under me are 55 creatives. Uh, it ranges from choreographers to orchestrators to choral directors to background singers to just a full task there. And we, we meet regularly, as you can imagine. On the production staff, there may be another 100 just there. And then all the cast that are working from surround sound, some of the things we're doing. There's some cool technology, and we'll get into the, you know, to the weeds of that, the geekdom of that. Uh, so it's a large, as I love to do, of course, but it's a very, very large staff. Thanks, Henry. Thank you. you know, Dave, I'm, I'm thinking, listening to Henry, Dave and I had the pleasure of meeting with Henry early on as he was beginning to work on the World Games Project and starting to do some recording, uh, working in his studio and upgrading his studio. By the way, everybody in the room, I also know Dave is often looking for staff. Um, Focusrite is a company that's growing rapidly, and one of the things, Dave, that you work on is consulting with and helping studios, sound stages, production facilities, and education as well. Um, right here at, at Full Sail is one of the largest Focusrite RedNet implementations. It's something that grew dramatically with the pandemic to solve problems. Maybe you could tell everybody a little bit about that part of your role and the kinds of things that you look like, look at when, uh, when, you, when you hire for the kind of work that you and I do on a regular basis. Absolutely, and I think it actually goes across the board for whatever you're gonna do. Um, the two things that really have always helped is uh, blind, dumb tenacity. Right, I'm not gonna stop. And the other thing that helps having blind, dumb tenacity is the fact of hearing no doesn't mean no. No always means not yet. So whether it be uh, an internship, uh, a job, or whatever you're gonna do in life, always understand someone's gonna tell you no, but it really means not yet. So whether it is working with a company working with uh, artistics it, it's all about being tenacious because you may catch someone on a bad day right and they can go I don't know who you are get away from me but that's not what they mean it's I'm having a bad day so for anything any career path to me that would probably be the the biggest thing um, because obviously in sales as well you gotta know that no doesn't mean no it means not yet thanks Dave Rafa, how about you? We got to talk a little bit at dinner last night about some of the cool projects you're working on. I'm sure the audience will love to hear what's well, happening. I have a very eclectic career, so I go from, I don't know, from the D'Angelo project to, to a Latin project to, to Residente, or then I jump to something else. So, and I al always love to, to keep it that way. And that's part of my pursuit of happiness. <laughs> that's part of my very personal way of viewing you know the world and my career and the possibilities and you just mentioned no is not a no and that's the biggest truth ever you know uh, when people think about what they could be doing to suc to succeed is keep doing it keep going at it. keep going at it i, I do, you don't even consider a uh, the outcome to be negative. I mean, just consider you are eventually going to make it. Somehow you're going to make it. So that was my attitude when, when I started my career. And the first studio I went to for an internship, actually I went to three different studios in LA. And the one I really wanted to get into, Ocean Way Recording, which back then was like the biggest thing in the US, it was actually had just been in the cover of Mix Magazine. Uh, that very month when I flew to LA, uh, the first thing they told me was no. And I understood that that no wasn't 
definite. Nothing is definite in life. And I just went back to that office and asked for it again. And they said, yes, okay, you are going to become, you're going to be, you're gonna be, we don't have a position for you. You're going to be our first intern ever. And that's how I put my foot, you know, in, in the door. But when you walk into any work relationship, what you mentioned is so truth, so, so truth. You have to be a, you have to be a great hang. You need to have good timing. You need to, you have to be super, super enthusiastic, but you need to know when to sow it. <laughs> when is the right time <laughs> to sow your enthusiasm? And when you need to be a fly in the wall. Maybe you need to be a fly in the wall for most of the session, and then towards the end, you can actually, you know, express yourself when you are in a more intimate kind of situation, maybe with the art is not right there, or I don't know, you have to, you have to really project how you like that situation to go if you were the producer. And I always had that in my head, even as an engineer. I became a great engineer, I think, because I was thinking as a producer, always, in every situation. I would walk into a room and I would know who the songwriter was, who the arranger was, what they needed, what, their, what were their insecurities, their fears. I don't know what the artist was going through. You, could, you know exactly what an artist is going through just by looking at him or her. You know, look at their face, and you are going to know in five seconds if you manage to learn to read people, you are going to know what that person is going through. You are going to know if that person is super scared of being there. And most people are a little bit scared of being in a session because it becomes a huge, huge test for them. You know, it's, it's a unique and a very limited opportunity for them to stand out, to really make something great. And everybody in this business, uh, I think, wants to make something great, go for greatness. And, but you are also confronted with the fragility of time. You only have a limited time to be great. <laughs> See, it's super hard. It's super hard to think about it that way, but that's the reality. So I would say that for the most part, you have to be all of that and be great at management, have great management skills. Be in the room and always know beforehand, before anybody else, you know, makes any kind of move, know what needs to happen next. And if you don't know, ask. Don't be afraid to ask, ever. Uh, respect the line of command, who the producer is, um, and go from there. But I think it's, it's very complicated, but quite simple at the same time. Quite, quite simple. Thank you, Rafa. I'm sure you're, in, you're all inspiring questions. Remember, folks, when we get toward the end of the session today, we're going to open up for questions. So some really great fodder for conversation there. Rafa, I'm going to come back to you. So we just had an amazing opportunity as a group to tour facilities here at Full Sail. We were in studios. Um, we were on the stages in some of the, the like vocal booths. We went to the Fortress and talked a little bit about eSports um, in the conversation. We talked about film, film scoring, sound. Rafa, with the projects that you've got on the docket, maybe something you can talk about um, that's coming up, um, if any of the students in this room are going to come up and talk to you about working on one of those projects, let's, we'll geek out a little bit and talk about technology because we saw so much here in the amazing facilities at Full Sail. What are some of the things, and I'll ask each of the panelists this, from a technical skills, chops, you know, there's immersive audio and Atmos, there's audio over IP and Dante and RedNet. What are some of the technical things that this audience should be thinking about? Because if you're gonna hire somebody for a project, they just gotta know that. What are some of the table stakes? They need to know more than I do. <laughs> no, but seriously, um, they, need to, they need to be so eager to read every manual, every information out there about the technology and follow the technology, you know? Be current with the technology. Um, it's moving super, super fast. I mean, when I started, and we're talking about 1992, we still use tape, but it was the first integration of digital tape. We're using a lot of the Mitsubishi digital, the Sony digital tape, uh, Pro Tools, the beginning of Pro Tools. We're using Pro Tools. Actually, I was one of the first people ever to use 
Pro Tools so much in a recording studio. But back then, we couldn't even synchronize things properly. So we will talk to technology people to develop new firmware, new, new things to be able to actually synchronize things and be able to use it, right? Uh, I remember working with uh, Dr. Dre, and we'll be in sessions, and we wanted to do something, and then we had trouble synchronizing things, and those were different times, and whoever knew a little bit more than the other about technology will get the gig. Basically, that's how it goes. So you need to be at the forefront of technology. You need to always be, refresh yourself with the new information, you know, an integration of that technology. That's super important. Not just know the technology, but imagine uses for it. Even uses that other people are not talking about. So you can actually be a little bit of an innovator in your own circle. And that brings a lot of value to whoever you are working with or who you are working for. I never like the, to say somebody's working for me. I only want people that work with me. Okay, I treat them as equals as long as they step up to the plate. And very, very early on, they get to have huge responsibilities. Not the small ones, but really, really big ones. But I always tell them, if you fail, don't be so focused on failing. Be focused on being great at it. Because if you fail, we're going to find you're going to have a second opportunity. It's not just like where somebody's going to kill you or something, right? But, and that's where you actually, because that's where you actually learn the most. Your first failures are the biggest learning lessons for life. Not in that very moment, but for life. You will always remember what went through at that, that very moment. And I'm not talking about the specific failure, but what was going through your head right before you failed. <laughs> what actions you took and which ones you didn't take or you ignore, you know, tell, tell, tell signs that something was going to be wrong, but you didn't follow your instinct. Uh, you have to f basically follow your instincts 24-7 in this industry. Thanks, Rafa. Uh, next over to Dave. Dave, you and I recently s spoke, and I know um, you recently helped with solutions for the Super Bowl broadcast. Uh, I also learned something from Dave in conversation this week. I didn't realize, do you know, talking about immersive audio, um, I didn't realize this. There's more Dolby Atmos certified rooms in Nashville. In the city of Nashville. Than any place else. So anywhere. Dave's kind of got his, his finger on the pulse of... Like, what techni technical chops do you need to have, and what are you th what things do you need to know because the industry is changing, as Rafa mentioned, really rapidly? Maybe talk a little bit about that. What? And it is it, it feels like it's almost lightning with it, right? Even though Atmos has been around, um, it's the adoption of it. And let's be fair, it's you know, title helps. Apple really helps when they decided to get behind Atmos. Um, and their spatial audio version of it, it just really helps pushing that technology because now you've got so many different ways that you can work with that technology. You can sit on your laptop with a DAW and do Atmos on headphones. It's not the same as being in a room with it, but it definitely helps. And it's keeping up. Like, what a great way to say it. You have to know the technology. You know, I started right at the tail end of tape. And we already had a Pro Tools machine. So it was straight to Pro Tools. So when I started recording on tape, I had to go backwards. And it was so funny to go, oh, that's why they call it that. Like we were saying the scrub function. It's like, because you would scrub the tape. It's just one of those things of you learned that history of it. But to keep ahead or be on top is really where you really want to be because of all of these things that are changing so incredibly fast. And it's hard for big environments to keep up because they're already keeping up with so many other things that being light and fluid sometimes really can help you as students because you can walk into these environments, be a good hang, don't be pushy, find your place to say it, but then say, oh, I can help with all of this. Thanks, Dave. Henry, I'm thinking for you, and this was part of conversation uh, last evening at dinner too, not only the World Games, 
Henry's working on a, a project with PBS over the next several years. So there's television, uh, films, you've got a film that won some awards. Um, what about from your perspective? That's a, like our other panelists, there's a, a significant variety of different kinds of projects you're working on. What do the students in the audience need to know? I think the most important aspect of being a technologist is to make sure whomever you're going to work with, that you can add value. And uh, Rafa said it uh, in passing, but it's so important. Uh, if I have to engage you, you can be smart, you can know a lot. But if I have to tell you every step that I need you to do, then I might as well do it. And typically what will happen is, I'm gonna do it much faster than the time I take to tell you to do it. So usually I always tell students, make sure you know who you're working with, what their needs are, and add value to them. So if you're going to an internship, learn about that company. If you're gonna hang with Rafa, or me, or whomever, know what they need, what they're doing. And so usually that's the first thing I think about. Uh, on interns I recommend, and on interns that I want to uh, uh, have work with me. I think the other part of this about learning technology, you have to be a sponge. There was a time when we would open our head, pull it back, and you expect a teacher just to pour things in your head, chapter one, all the way to the end of the book. We have a hyper-learning environment now that has really gone through the roof logarithmically. You have to pick up every magazine. I can remember when MIDI was a magazine. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I would read that magazine, and I have stacks aside my bed, and this is what I do. I get the magazine, I fly through. I'm interested in that, I'm interested in that. I fold it back, I'm interested in that. And I, then I go back. I've been doing this for decades, and I still do it. Same here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, no, seriously, that's part of a great technique. It, it, so, yeah. It's the only way you can stay, because there's no academic book. By the time the book is published, guess what? It's out of date. So the best way you can stay current is to do that. And my, my, my wife hates it because it stacks of magazines by my bed. But this is the way you have to learn and love learning. Uh, and there's just no, no substitute for that. Thanks, Henry. It reminds me, um, and for those of you in the audience, uh, if you look back at episode two, the previous episode of this Focus Right Pro Audio and Education webinar series, we had um, Carlos Freitas on... Um, the mastering engineer, and one of the conversations we had with Carlos in that, um, in that discussion was like, how much has changed as a mastering engineer having to be flexible? Carlos has an incredibly um, long career, but you know, what does Netflix need today? What does Amazon need today? What does public, what does PBS need if you're gonna d deliver episodes for them for the coming four or five years? Um, being on top of what's coming, what's happening, listening, and then Here's our next topic for everybody on the panel, and I'm sure the audience is going to be interested in hearing about this. Um, networking, connections, and finding your path to what that amazing gig, career, or that series of gigs that end up in your resume and your portfolio are going to be. I'd love to hear from you on the panel. What's some of the, what are some of the networking tips that you have to offer? You know, I'm thinking... For instance, just quickly with Rafa, Rafa has been really active in his in roles at the Recording Academy and the Latin Academy for years. I know having um, many colleagues and friends, including those on stage involved in the Recording Academy, that's a lot of getting to know, supporting each other, the community of music makers, production um, folks, engineers, the P&E wing. Um, maybe maybe we start there, Rafa, because you have so much experience working across so many people that touch the Recording Academy, and many of the audience here will be will be members, and maybe award winners someday. I think it's a great organization, and what attracted me to to both of these you know, organizations wasn't because I was winning them or <laughs> anything like that, but was because of their mission. And their main mission was, one of them was actually education, and the other one was protecting the, you know, music makers, you know, you know, protecting music makers, basically. Protecting them with the new laws that were being passed in Congress. Um, so we could be a healthier community as, you know, as creators, you know, as a creative, creative people. And... And I think that networking is half of the game. 
when you are building your career. You cannot dismiss where the opportunities are. You really don't know where the opportunities are. They might be right in front of you, and you're just looking the other way. That's what happens most often. So you have to be a little bit hyperactive in terms of how you build relationships. And keep in mind, your first huge opportunity at creating relationships is right here in this very room. This is the, your very first opportunity to find people that are alike and people who are not. They don't need to be alike. Uh, maybe the, your personalities don't match in terms of personality, but your goals maybe match. And yeah, and your dedication matches. And your, yeah, what you see as your future in the industry matches. And sooner or later, you're going to cross paths in the industry. And if you already know that person, that's going to be a huge advantage to you because familiarity is very, very important. Because this is a business where when you get in a studio, you are exposing yourself. You are like, in a way, bare naked to the world. You are exposing your art, right? You are exposing your insecurities, your values. Um, familiarity helps. If you have people that you can trust, you can have those kind of people around you, the better. So I will say that in terms of networking, uh, when I came out of Full Sail, the first thing I did was uh, try to become a member of AES. Uh, then next to, uh, right afterwards, try to become a member of whatever other organization I will, you know, learn about. Even organizations I didn't know about, some of them told me, you know, piss off, they didn't even let me in because I, I wouldn't qualify. But uh, try to get to in organizations where you can actually mingle with other people that are alike. You know, try to find your path. You don't really know where opportunities are and what your path is ultimately going to be. So you have to try everything. Thanks, Rafa. Dave, how about you next? A lot of what I just heard you say is, don't be a jerk. There are so many people in this room that quite possibly could have mind-numbingly amazing careers. And they can help you as you can help them. It's just the way it works. And we were even saying last night, there are so many opportunities from knowing other people that will come your way that may not be a big direction in your life. But I had a good friend. We both had studios near each other. And he called in a whim. And he's like, hey, I thought you had a project right now. I'm like, canceled. Said, cool. I need someone on a movie set. So I said, of course, yeah, because if you say no, you don't know. So I spent a month on a movie set. It was awesome. It wasn't as disillusioning for me as it may have been for you, but it was that thing of you get to try things and you don't know where your path goes. Don't say no. Be friends with people. That's how you're going to keep moving forward. Don't be a jerk. He said that because I worked on a movie set one time with Tom Hanks. I was super young. And I couldn't watch a movie for the following three years <laughs> because I know what was going on behind, you know, behind the scenes. <laughs> I was like, oh, God, there must be 100 people this side of the <laughs> shot. And it was terrible for me. I love it. I'm going to turn to Henry next. And I'm just thinking, Henry, we were reflecting. Um, Henry and I met each other 25 years ago. Check me if I'm wrong. A little or maybe a little bit more in normal Illinois at the College Music Society meeting there. The and now we've stayed in touch for more than 25 years and crossed paths, me at many different companies in many different roles. And I've had the pleasure of watching Henry grow in his career. I know his wife. I know his children. Um, for, for me, just it, it, it struck me in this conversation. I've got folks sitting right next to me that have um, given me the honor and the pleasure of being able to collaborate with them over time. And it was a chance meeting at a conference that I just sort of picked out of the air and said, I want to go there and meet some people and see what happens. You make great friends that way, colleagues, you find projects. This is how I've found jobs in my career over the more than 30 years that I've worked in it. 
So, Henry, first of all, thank you <laughs> thank for you. being a dear friend for so many years. But share with the audience, what, what are some networking moments and advice you'd offer up to them? And thank you, Lee. We have been great friends for 25 years. And I just appreciate, Lee, for tolerating me over those 25 <laughs> years. You know, I was thinking about what my colleagues were saying. And I really believe that you're on this journey right now. And don't despise your journey because you're on you're networking now and don't despise the little job I and I joke last night and it's not really a jerk I did a lot of work and do a lot of work with church music and I would joke and say you know I would do almost anything before notation software there I'd be writing orchestral scores copying the parts by hand and they say we give you a love offering and there wasn't much love in that offering I eventually got you know <laughs> but I'm just saying but I but for me I had a chance to do that. And I can think of all these experiences where it was the experience that became the networking, that my gift began to reveal itself. And I didn't despise doing the little thing. I wasn't trying to get that great gig at the very beginning without paying my dues. You can't escape putting your 10,000 hours in. It's just not going to happen. But people will begin to find you. And I can honestly say that in my career that the gigs where I just thought I would go after have never turned out as well as the many gigs I've gotten where the phone call has just kind of been there. Hey, you've done this. How about doing this for me? And that's been my whole career. And I think you're there now building that network, building those careers, building those experiences that when someone calls you and asks you, can you do this? Yeah, I can do that. You see? Thanks, Henry. And you know, it occurs to me, Rafa and I shared a similar moment last night. We've pa crossed paths um, tangentially over the years. And when we got together for dinner, we were comparing notes because I said to Rafa, when we had that meeting over Zoom not too long ago, I was like digging through my mental Rolodex. And when did we meet at the first time? And the first in-person meeting happened to be an event connected to the Recording Academy. Uh, I, we were working with the Grammy Music Education Coalition, had an event at the iconic um, Village Recorder in LA, in West LA, the recording studio. And it just was one of those things that through the dinner conversation and thinking about the networking and connections you make over time, it was like, ah, light bulb moment. That's where it was where we met the first time. Although yes. we have many people in common, so. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, you, you, you never know. and. Keep in mind that how you get to work with people has to do with reaffirmation too. You have to see those people more than once, usually. You know, nobody gets starstruck on the first, in the first meeting, usually. But you, you have to, you know, you have to become a little bit familiar to other people. And that's how, yeah, people, first of all, people know that you haven't died. <laughs> Second, you know, or, the, you know, it's a reaffirmation you haven't died. Secondly, you know, you, they know you are serious about it because you keep coming. <laughs> you keep coming at them, right? You keep showing up. So that's the first thing. Show up. Always show up. Um, There's another one. Never be late to anything, to anything in life. Never, ever be late. Uh, thank you, Rafa. Absolutely. So I want to remind everybody here in the audience... We will be taking questions. You've heard some amazing advice from our panelists, so we'll get to that. We're going to um, focus on one other topic. I'm going to ask our panel to share an anecdote before we get to questions with all of you. So panelists, um, and, and this is me calling an audible. I didn't quite prepare them for this one, but it's a fun one. Actually, Rafa and Henry have been in the room when I've, I've thrown this sort of softball question out before, but I love this question. So he, here's the topic. I'd love to hear from each of you a moment in your musical and audio careers where you were changed. So we'll breathe on that for just a minute. What I'm asking, and I'm sure all of you have this moment, I've had this moment in my career and my life, what's a moment where you can think back and say, you know what, something happened musically that changed me. Changed me for good. Could be something simple, a chance meeting, could be something that you had planned to happen, but is there a moment like that in your career that you can think about that you could share with everybody? I'm sure the audience would love to hear it. Rafa, you want to, to go me, first? I think there are two moments. Moment number one 
uh, in my career where I was blown away. I get my internship at Ocean World Recording and it's, it was a big complex, nine studios, nine recording studios, three of them orchestra rooms. So they used to, be every, they used to do everything over there, the, the Academy Awards, you know, the pre-recording of the Academy Awards with the big orchestra, I was part of that in my early years with Bill Conti as the composer, conductor, and so I was part of those. And, but the very first time I walk into the live room with an orchestra playing, and I got to the, right next to the conductor, and I could hear all of those emotions that come from he, listening to a live orchestra right next to you and feeling it you never forget. This is one of those moments. I mean, to me, that was life-changing. I have worked with orchestras ever since. I'm actually right now working on five different orchestral projects. And the other moment was the day, and I don't know, it happened randomly, the day I thought to myself, I'm a good mixer. <laughs> no, seriously, but I thought to myself, I think I know what I'm doing. Somehow, I don't know, I was enlightened in some kind of way, in some sort of way, but it had to do with production. Same thing I, as I mentioned earlier, how to become a great engineer, become a producer. I became an okay mixer when I was thinking as a producer, when I started thinking as a producer. And I was taking responsibility for the song, no matter what. I was taking like a, I was, putting the producer's hat even as an engineer. Even when you're recording the orchestra, you have to have that producer's hat all the time. So you become valuable to everybody, to the real producer, to the composer, to the songwriter, to the artist, you become their best ally, period. So yeah, that, those were for me the two moments, yeah. Fantastic, love it, thank you, Rafa. Dave, let's go to you next and then Henry. I think the the first internship I had was at a studio called Chicago Recording Company. Um, three big music rooms, uh, a whole ton of post-production rooms, but I just wanted to do the music side. Um, the studio manager came up to me, sat me down, and said, you're a little old for this. Turns out they actually had a bet to see how long the old guy would last as an intern. That was nice. Um, he sat me down and said, you're old enough to know better, so your whole job is to make sure that as an intern, you're thinking about what the assistant needs and you're knowing what they're gonna need before they ask. And I'm like, got it. And he's like, not done. When you're the assistant, it goes up. You're always thinking what the next person needs and you're always thinking about that. So whenever you're moving forward, you're always seeing yourself ahead and you're learning everything you can because you want to know what that job is. It's similar to what you were saying, um, but more of a, a, a stepped process of always be prepared to cover the person above you because that's going to make you go far. You know, I, there have been many sessions when I was an assistant and an engineer would do something super wrong and you would just go, sorry, my bad. And you'd get yelled at and it would be a thing. But then afterwards, they'd come up and go, man, what do you need? You can be on any of my sessions. Thank you so much. Because the artist can't lose faith in certain people. And you'll learn that. So that'd be my thing. Thanks, Dave. How about you, Henry? You know, I have so many moments that, and I'm still getting them, that kind of affirms who I am and why I chose to be a musician. And I've worn a lot of hats and still do, from producer to arranger, conductor. As Rafa know, my big thing is orchestra conducting. That's kind of what I do. And for Stevie, that's what I do whenever he needs an orchestra and needs a conductor. But I can tell you a moment that, that really stood out, being a young man, watching some of the major orchestras throughout the world, and then looking up one day, and there I was on the concert stage with the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra in front of me. And then, because I'm facing them, and then Stevie Wonder behind me. Uh, that, those are moments that'll make you feel pretty good, you know? <laughs> and then, of course, on every continent, all the major orchestras of the world, that basically I may not have had a chance to conduct, but it's been many orchestras now. But I look at those moments, but still, the joy 
of just knowing that I'm a musician and someone appreciates the fact that I had something to offer. That was an informing moments to me. And so I, I don't know. I'm still getting them, Rafa. <laughs> Can I add just something that just came to my head and I think it's so, so important? You, you need to find joy in being challenged in this industry. Some people take it wrong, like what you were talking, right? You are in front of this orchestra for the first time. And I've been there too, you know, Royal Philharmonic and London Symphony and all of these experiences. And the first time you get exposed to some of these experiences, you might not do as well as you thought you, might, you, you could do, right? And you get challenged. Find joy in it. Find some kind of joy because it, it becomes a, a huge, huge opportunity for you to learn and to, to get to be better and to, be, to become to be a badass, right? And if you think you are doing everything 100% all the time and nobody challenges you or you don't take the criticism properly, you are never gonna progress. You are ne ne never gonna become great. You're gonna be good, but not great. So I, I would say that learn not to feel offended by people's comments. To this day, when I'm producing a project, especially you know, up and coming artists, you know, I'm, I have worked with everybody from Michael Jackson to Stevie Wonder to you name it. The new up and coming band, I'm producing their first ever release and they challenge me you know, left and right. And sometimes the challenges come from inexperience, a lack of knowledge even, but I cannot take it wrong. Sometimes they are right. They know something I don't. They feel something I'm not feeling or I haven't learned to feel properly. Uh, they know what they're looking for and I might be missing it. So even as an established producer, I I'm always listening. I'm always even listening to the chit chat. That's very, very, that's one of the biggest source of information in a recording studio. Not, uh, not the instructions they might give you, but the chit chat. Do you know, they are just joking with a friend, oh, but do you know the bridge of the song? Yeah, yeah, it sounds like, I don't know, they might mock it or say like, and you're like, oh shit, they don't like it. There's something that is not agreeable to them. Oh, I better check it out. But they might never tell you, even as the producer or as the mixer, but somebody makes a little joke or a little comment, never miss on any of this information. It's super, super important. So yeah, be a great, great listener. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all. So we've got some help from this fabulous production team here at Full Sail in the room. And now it's your opportunity to ask some questions. We've got an amazing set of experiences here on stage. Who'd like to start? Hands up. We've got microphone in the room. I think we're going to take some questions online, too. Uh, my name is JT. I'm in Recording Arts. I guess this is a little bit less of a question than it is a uh, vision of the future that I've had. The death of stereo as a medium. There's been CDs, there's been tape, now there's streaming, but the actual idea of two speakers projecting, y'all mentioned a little bit of Dolby Atmos, um, but I'm envisioning recording a drum set and as my brain internalizes, it's a drum set and now I can copy and paste that wherever I want. Um, this is in Jill's field, and I was just wondering your opinion on that idea. If you guys don't mind, I talk about this stuff every day. Um, death seems a little bit heavy. <laughs> um, but absolutely, I mean, the conversations that uh, we have now, it's not just we're going to put this track into Dolby Atmos, right, or Sony 360. The conversation is how can I track or how can I create a track that already feels like it's in that environment so you people are sitting there thinking about where am I going to put extra mics instead of doing a classic I'm going to do the drums I'm going to have you know distance mics well now it's going to be well if I know I'm going to have distance mics what can I do to make that special where am I going to put these things um, and with more of a standardization that seems to be happening uh, it will keep moving forward, but I think it's going to be very hard to get rid of stereo. Okay. I mean, stereo's beat quad. 
be Rafa, five did, one. Did you have something to add to that one? No, no, I agree. I agree with what he said. You know, it's going to take a little while, uh, but but we're already thinking about that in every project that we yeah get involved with. Yeah. Next question. Thank you for that one. Uh, hi, my name is Gabriel. I'm about to finish my music production program. Um, classic scenario, if you could go back in time and tell something to yourself back in college, uh, what would it be? Like, what main thing would you say? Yeah. If I understand you correctly, you want to go back and, and, and tell the time in college of something that happened in that period that, that did what? Yeah, the, qu the question was, if you could get in a time machine, mm -hmm. based on your experience today, and go back, what would you tell yourself? What'd you miss? You know, <laughs> um, hindsight is twenty twenty, right? But I, <laughs> um, it's not only what I would say to myself, it's what I would say to the students coming behind me, like you, which is, if I knew what I knew today back then, boy, would I be so much farther in many ways. Um, I think for me, it's always been about the passion of knowing who I am, what I am. For example, we're in fields where it's always about competition, not unlike athletics. But it doesn't mean that you don't have something to offer because that next guy is better than you. Or you may be the best oboe player in the world. We talked about this last night. But does that mean just because you recognize that your chances of getting to play oboe in the New York Philharmonic may be slim, that all of a sudden you got to decide that, no, I'm not going to be a musician? No. What you should do is look for opportunities, like I've heard my colleagues say, where you can kind of build on your skill set and stay into this career. We need great musicians. We, everybody's not going to be a Rafa or Dr. Whitmore or my colleagues all, and some of the ones here. We basically still, though, have something to be. And, and one of the things I like to say is that, boy, it's great that I get to be a musician. Not to knock anything else, but if I think about that going back, so many young people, even today, uh, in my classes are more interested in the great gig first. They want that one hit. It only takes one. And they want to be great. But see, greatness comes with a lifetime. Greatness doesn't come automatically. And so if you think you're going to be great overnight, it's just not going to happen. I think we're all still trying to be great. I don't know where it is. It's kind of elusive. But I'm still trying to be great. But I'm happy where I am, still on that journey. You are so right. I'm still trying to be great. I don't think I'm great yet. And it's true. And I think that's the, the pursuit of what I was talking about, the pursuit of your own happiness and your own goals. Um, but it depends on you. You have to be you. Basically, you have to be you and you have to recognize that and respect it and learn to be you and yeah, be great on your own way. <laughs> Thanks, Rafa. How about a next question? Who's up next? Uh, I wanted to ask, what is your structure for creating a composition? Like if you could, if you had to choose one element of music that most of your composition tend to revolve around, what would it be? So what was the question? Was so the question is um, about um, structure, composing, creation. Like where do you start? What, what for you, where does that inspiration come? Is there a tool? Is there some kind of compositional mechanism? What's the inspiration? Well, um, I listen, first of all, to everything. I can recall when I was in undergrad as a classical music major, knowing that I was the biggest Earth, Wind & Fire plan, uh, fan on the planet. But yet, I was doing, you know, singing in the opera, in the concert band, in the orchestra, in the jazz band, and basically forbidden for being in the gospel choir because it might mess my voice up. I said, wait a minute, I gotta be in the gospel choir, you know? but. All those things for structure and style, creativity lives in a different place than the practice of theory. 
So when you're thinking about form and structure, you def we learned that. There's song forms, orchestral forms, all the things that you will get when, in those traditional classes. But if you're talking about that, you can be any person and get that. It's what you bring as a creator to those forms that basically make you independent and individual. So there are only 12 notes in the chromatic scale. So how do you, and you take those 12 notes and do something original? I sing a lot to myself. If I hear something, it can be a rhythm. I was walking to Japan and heard something coming out of a temple. I said, man, I never heard that combination of rhythms together. I recorded it. If I hear a singer, I hear a phrase from anybody from Lady Gaga to Michael Bublé to you name it, to Red Hot Chili Peppers, it really doesn't matter. If it's fresh, wow, I haven't heard that. And some of the best rhythmic musicians today are hip hop musicians. I mean, they're doing things that we've never thought about or even writing before. And basically, it's almost as if we have to kind of imitate what they are doing. So for me, if you're asking about form and composition, sketch. Sketch and put it away. Just put a little idea, you hear it, record it on a tape and put it away. And then come back to that. One of the best creative tools I love are the DAWs today. You can use them in logic or in reason. I love reason for how simple it is and quickly at being uh, creative. Of course, I love Pro Tools. And so I use all of them to just put these elements in. And the plethora of, of software for doing orchestras and rhythms and all of these things, even GarageBand, you know, not even GarageBand. If you open the hood up in GarageBand, you will find out that it's a powerful DAW. But most people just don't get past the loops in that. So I hope that kind of answers your question if you were just asking about form and creativity. Rafi, you want to add something to that? No, uh, uh, you have to be open all the way to, till the end of the process. Like, I was just thinking, you know, uh, a single I produced just got released today for this band, and I remember um, we edited the song and reworked the song after it was mixed. <laughs> so we could wait, it, you know, we had to wait till the very end to realize, you know what, uh, there could be another, there could be a couple more additional moments in this song that you know that pull you pull you away and then back into the lyrics of the song and whatnot so we we created new parts after the fact and i do that a lot with lots of productions there isn't such thing as oh it's already recorded man we're done uh, you're never done if if you come out with a new exciting proposal an idea is never done you can beat it up till the very end <laughs> and i think that's a great and i think that's a great attitude because you know your intuition always tells you best your intuition should be your first priority the first thing that you need to develop in this industry is personal intuition about everything you do fantastic another question Hi, I'm Peter. Uh, I'm a recording arts uh, student. There we go. Uh, I'm a recording arts student uh, online, and I came down here for Hall of Fame from New York. Um, and uh, thank you very much, everybody, for sacrificing your time to be a part of this. Um, I had a question as far as psychology, the psychology of the people you were working with. I'm a musician. I've been on the side of, you know, with a very gentle, <laughs> loving producer working with me. Well, I don't think that works. And then now I'm practicing because of my degree, how to do that, how to be that psychologist for someone who's, like you said, gentle or someone who's new, it's their first record. Um, how does it differentiate between working with someone new and working with Stevie Wonder when he comes to you and needs arranging, you know, uh, how much of a loose garment or how much hand-holding, that sort of thing? I think that with experience, you don't differentiate between the top artist or the new up and coming artist. You don't differentiate. It's all the same game, it's the same. Obviously, it comes with different rules. You know, there are different rules and there comes different, you know, additional experience from their part. But in terms of engagement, it's very, very similar. And it's, it's not only about nurturing them and making them feel good and all that. Sometimes you, you have to make them feel bad. Sometimes you have to challenge them and you expect them to challenge you. Uh, one of the things I always tell my, my clients, I'm very, very suspicious of people 
that don't challenge me. Uh, maybe they don't want to be good enough, or they're just okay with being good enough. They, are, they don't want to be great. And when, for, for example, when I finish a mix, and they have like very few comments, and the first one that goes like back to them like, oh, come on, give me a break. Uh, there must be something that, you know, you feel could be better or, because I'm not making the best mix. They're helping me make the best mix possible. Same as a producer, same as a musician, even in a session, even if you are hired just as a session musician, you need to ask yourself, uh, is this, is this it? Or could it be better? You, ha you need to find a way of asking in a gentle kind of way, you know, maneuver and, you know, through those waters and find out if you could even do better. You know, one of the things that's really important to thinking about your own careers, you really can't settle. Meaning that when you do a recording, your name and, and your work is on that recording forever. It doesn't matter whether it's a Stevie Wonder record, or if it's your, your, your brother's daughter. Uh, you've got to let that artist know that you've got to do your best to make it pleasing sonically and musically and all of that. So usually when someone comes to me, and we get a lot of them wanting us to produce, you know, my kid's the best kid, and they can sing better than anybody on my street, you know, kind of thing. And it's like, well, can they really? And are you prepared? And you really have to think about your own careers and think about the time that you're willing to put into a project. So I'm willing to put as much time into that project as I would do any major project and treat it just as seriously to make sure that, you know, that it can be produced as best I can. You know, and there's, there is a pitfall to this as well because early on, you may take that idea of my name's on this and it's not gonna go out unless it's right. It's not your job to know what's right. It's your job to get to what their vision of right is while also protecting your name. So uh, I would say this is all absolutely true, um, but it's, at the end of the day, it's not about you. Even though it is your art, it is your talent, it is your vision as well, but it's not about you. And, and, and there's two different things, too, I think, too. One is the creativity, and one is the quality of the recording. So it depends on what your role is. I think that if an artist comes to you and they're only interested in you making that record sound as good. And I'll tell you the truth. I listen to many poor performers that if it sounds good in the recording, I'm subject, I'll listen to it. But I've heard many, many great singers. And if I can get past a bad recording, chances are I'm not going to listen to it. Yeah, I was just going to add something, and this is my very, very personal view, of course, but I think that you have to be a little bit selfish. You need to, you, ha you must not be, a, be afraid of your own ego, of having your own ego about it, because it's about being creative, right? It's about uh, creating something or helping somebody else create something, but you become part of that creation, and it's also your own say on it. So adding to that, yeah, it is true, but uh, you have to defend your position all the time. And last thing I, I will add is that we need more women in the industry. <laughs> we haven't mentioned it, but, and I'm in this campaign about it. I have been for years, and I just came from one of those retreats with the Academy about it. And, and it's a shame that the industry has been isolating them for so long, you know, f forever, <laughs> let's say. And I think it's time to change the whole perspective. Absolutely agree. Well, did you all have a great time? <laughs> I know I did, and on behalf of Focusrite Group, thank you, Dave. Thank you, Rafa. Thank you, Henry. Thanks to all of you and to Full Sail University for this opportunity to share about careers in music and that path. So have a great rest of the Hall of Fame. Great to be here. Look forward to seeing you next year. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, production crew. Thanks, Full Sail University.